Good morning, Plymouth Nazarene family and house and online. I'm Pastor Dusty, and you are loved. So if I was going to tell you a story, and I started with the phrase, once upon a time, what images would that conjure up? Maybe a small stone hut with a thatch roof uh, and a hardworking peasant family. Maybe you'd think of a castle and a dragon and a princess. But by the very first sentence, you know it's a fairy tale. Uh, you expect it to there to be creatures and maybe a witch and some sort of moral lesson for children, right? If I start a story with, on a dark and stormy night, you, what imagery does that bring up? You know, it's going to be a horror story, maybe out in the woods of an abandoned summer camp. Um, if I start a story with, in a galaxy far, far away, that conjures up images of a copyright lawyer. Um, <laughs> So opening lines matter. Opening lines matter to a story, an email, a phone call, or when you're greeting a stranger. So today as we start a new series, we're going verse by verse through the book of 1 John, uh, one of my favorite books in the New Testament. And I want you to keep a close eye on the opening line. Here's 1 John 1.1. 1, 1. That which was from the beginning. Uh-oh, we got a trigger word right off the bat. So when you start that way, you are making a point. What's the opening line of the Bible? In the beginning, In the beginning God. Uh, how does the Gospel of John start? In the beginning was the Word. Speaking of which, my, my personal preference, I think they got the order of the Bible wrong. Um, obviously, Genesis, in the beginning, God... The Gospel of John should have been the first Gospel. The beginning of the New Testament should have been, in the beginning was the Word. Luke should have been the fourth Gospel. That's the first half of his book. The second half of his book is Acts. If I ever assemble a Bible, the New Testament's going to go John, Matthew, Mark, Luke. But here we are. So anyway, um, <clears throat> so this is a callback. John is starting his first of three letters with a callback to creation and a callback to his Gospel. He's using creation language to say that God is forming something new. He's creating something, he's building something that will change everything. Get ready for light, life, movement, action, and renewal. So let's continue on there in verse 1. That which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, our hands have handled concerning the word of life. So I love lists. Any other list lovers in here? All right, a couple of us. Um, and apparently John does too, because his opening line is a list. And I like to think of this list as four levels of interaction with Jesus. He says, that which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and which we, our hands have handled, the word of life. So long before John was writing a gospel, long before he was writing three letters to churches, long before he wrote the Revelation, he heard about Jesus. Maybe from his brother. Maybe from his father. Maybe from another fisherman. Maybe from some friends in the market or at the temple. But when John heard the call from Jesus to come follow me, that probably was not the first time he had heard about Jesus. Now, you know people like this. They may have never been to church even once, but they know some words to some Christmas carols. They've been to funerals and weddings, and they've heard the words of Jesus. They've seen movies, books, TV shows where Jesus was represented or misrepresented. And these people are not yet considering following Jesus, but they've heard about him. So that's step one. Step two is seen with our eyes. People at this step have observed God at work, either in their own life or in the lives of people that they are close to. They wouldn't deny a miracle, a healing, a provision, divine direction. They would say, yes, that is God at work. I've absolutely seen him at work. But it's not affecting their daily choices yet. So this is most people in the Old Testament. I call this group God's people. So they would identify themselves as the people of God. They would absolutely, you know, claim that and be proud of that. And they're kind of interested in what he's up to, but they don't really want to obey God. Hey, Moses, you go up to the mountain, talk to God, get those commandment dealies or whatever, and we'll stay down here. I think your brother has a sculpture he wanted to get started on anyway. Uh, so many times 
God's people wanted to hear from him when they were in trouble, and they inquired of the prophets. They looked to the book of the law. They prayed, but they weren't that interested or committed in living out the answers that they were given. So I have a question for you. Do you have a medical doctor that you can trust? Do you have a car mechanic that you can trust? Now, with both of those professions, you are putting your life into the hands of someone else's expertise and their decisions. You even inconvenience yourself to trust them. You take time off work. You pay huge sums of money. You'll change your lifestyle, your diet, or your schedule depending on what these people tell you to do. Now, how do you know if you can trust your doctor or your mechanic? Is it by the degrees and certifications that they have on their wall? No, that's, that's an indicator, but that's not enough. Is it by word of mouth recommendation from a friend? Well, that's also good, but that's secondhand info. If you really want to know if you can trust your doctor or your mechanic, you have to obey what they're asking you to do. Will this prescription help me? I won't know if I don't take it regularly. Will replacing this part in my car keep it safe to drive? I won't know if I don't take their advice. If I decide which medicine and how often to take it, it's not my fault if I don't get better or if I have terrible side effects. It's not my doctor's fault, it's mine. If I just open up the hood of my car and start wrenching on random bolts, disconnecting fuses and and hoses, it is not my mechanic's fault when my engine lights on fire. So how do I know if God is trustworthy? I have to actually do what he said in his word. We don't want to be hearers of God's word only. We want to be doers. We want to be led by love. And that's what this series is all about. That's what this book is all about. It's active, it's directional, it's purposeful. So look back to um, verse 2. John writes this. The one who is life itself was revealed to us, and we have seen him. And now we testify and proclaim to you that he is the one who is eternal life. He was with the Father, and then he was revealed to us. We proclaim to you that what we ourselves have actually seen and heard so that, we may have, so that you may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that you may, be, so that you may fully share our joy. So John is saying that God has revealed himself to us, his people, and that we can actually know him in a real relational way. It's more than doctrine. It's more than rules. It's more than a religious system. It's fellowship with the Heavenly Father. It's an active, two-way relationship. So the reason John hits on this right up front is because he's going to have to address some serious issues that have infected this church that he's writing to. And he's not afraid of bringing difficult truth, but his motivation is love for God and love for people. Now, never forget, these are real letters written by real people to a real pastor of a real church. John didn't just sit down to write the Bible, page one. He is writing to a pastor of a struggling church, and it became part of the Bible. So is it God's inspired word? You bet. But it's also a real letter from a real man to a real church. Look at verse 5. This, then, is the message we have heard from Jesus and now declare to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Uh Uh-oh. Did you catch another trigger word? There was two of them this time. What was the message John is declaring? God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Now, does that sound like intentional imagery? Light and darkness? Hmm, I wonder what that's a reference to. How did he start this letter again? That which is from the beginning. It's more creation language, right? So behold, all things have become new. So after this, he gets right into some application and a challenge. Verse 6. So we are lying if we say that we have fellowship with God, but go on living in spiritual darkness. We are not practicing the truth. John is saying if we've become new on the inside, it affects how we live on the outside. This is practical holiness. So I also really like the phrase that he ends with. He uses the phrase practicing the truth. 
It's not a matter of knowing it. It's not a matter of mastering it one time. It's something you put into practice regularly and continually. Sometimes you'll get it wrong, but you keep practicing. Uh, The next sentence is so critical to this book and to our theology. He says, if we are living in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with... Now, if you didn't know what was coming up next and you had to guess, fill in the blank, you would probably guess it to be him. If God is in the light and when, when we walk in the light, we have fellowship with... I would assume it to be him. It's not the word. Look at verse 7. If we are living in the light as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. When we're living in the light, our relationships with each other are affected, and even that is connected to Christ's blood cleansing us from all sin. So this book is going to hint on this theme in every single chapter, that we cannot claim a relationship with God vertical and treat people poorly, horizontal. He said it doesn't work that way. You cannot compartmentalize and say, well, I'm good with God, and there's just a bunch of jerks around me. No, it doesn't work that way. This affects this, and really where it affects it is right here. So here's a video of two people who loved God, but they were getting loving each other Very wrong. When it came to marriage, we thought we knew everything. We didn't know diddly squat, but but we thought we did. We kind of thought marriage would be like when we dated. We laughed a lot, had fun a lot. In our early years of marriage, marriage was just hard right from the beginning. Conflict for us was continual. That doesn't mean that every time we got together there was a fight. Sometimes you wouldn't know there's a problem. It was very difficult for me to be submissive or respect a husband. I honestly never knew how to do that. It was never modeled for me. I never understood it. I actually didn't know for a man that respect was a big deal, that really it was more important than love. I know love is important for Julie. I didn't understand that as a husband myself, but I look back And what would really set me down is if I'd come home, she would start off with something negative right away. Or anything I said, she's got kind of a strong personality. She's going to tell me what's wrong and what we ought to do. I I want to kind of lead our family, but what it did for me is I just, well, you just go ahead and you do that. That's your thing. I'm out. I mean, I'm out of there. But that's how it affected on me. I guess I started nagging and never wanted to do that. Larry, when are you going to be home? Are you going to be home for dinner tonight? I really need your help with the kids. We need some things done around the house. I really need your home. When are you going to be home? I never let up. There was like nothing positive. At least if there was positive, I didn't hear that. I only heard what's wrong with this, what I didn't do. And what I heard was, you're not really capable. You're not much of a man. You're not much of a husband. She didn't use those words, but that's the message I heard. My head knew that Larry loved me. And my heart never met my head. My heart never really felt like I was loved unconditionally. And I'm thinking, Lord, how can you ask me to do this? How could he ask me to love and submit to a man that I never really felt loved me? He only loved what I could do for him. And it was many years later when I realized as I was reading God's word that my relationship with my husband was a direct picture of my relationship with the Almighty. And I thought, oh my goodness, if I treated God like I treat Larry, that is not a good thing. That was devastating to me. The Lord that I loved, I would never treat like that. And so it caused me to look at my heart and regardless of what Larry did, how did I really love him? How did I submit myself to him and how did I respect him? And she started reflecting to me Christ and the way she addressed me is just moving. And I thought, what in the world is going on in my wife? All of a sudden, he just started to change. He asked me how he could pray for me. He just started doing like the dishes that he would never do before. He was kinder. Sometimes if I would get snappy, he, he would just love me regardless. 
And as I learned to trust Larry and learned to let God heal my heart, uh, it's, it's kind of amazing <laughs> what God does. It's great. So that couple loved God, but they were not living out that love in a practical expression to each other. So do you remember John's phrase earlier? He said he mentions practicing the truth. That's what these two had to start doing. And it might feel unnatural, uncomfortable, and it certainly was not what they were used to. But when they started putting their spouse's needs ahead of their own, they started to see God at work. Uh, he loved her with his actions and service, and she respected him with her words and attitude, and it renewed their relationship with God, and it renewed their relationship with one another, which is a win-win. So the final of this section of this chapter is a familiar one, and it addresses the sin problem. Every human being has a theology of sin. Maybe it's one they inherited from their culture, uh, their parents or their church. Maybe it's one they wrote themselves or tweaked and adjusted over time. But as humans, we don't even live up to the standards that we set for ourselves, let alone God's standards. And how do we handle that? How do we handle when somebody else steals from you or lies to you? How do you handle your own conscience when you harm somebody with your words or your actions? Everyone has a theology of sin you have some way to deal with it in your own heart and life. Of course, I would encourage you to adopt the New Testament theology of sin. And John lays it out here very well in verse 8. If we claim that we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. But if we confess our sins to God, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. If we claim that we haven't sinned, we're calling God a liar and his word has no place in our hearts. So some people's theology of sin is that it doesn't exist and that everything is permissible. Many people use comparative sin. Well, yeah, I make some mistakes, but I'm not as bad as... And another classic line is, well, look, I'm only human. God will understand. Or, hey, I'm doing my best, but nobody's perfect. The problem with all of those theologies of sin are they don't take personal responsibility. The blame is on God, on human nature, on circumstances, on somebody else. You simply will not be able to move forward if you can't be honest with yourself and with God. Now, there is a powerful word that unlocks spiritual freedom, but I have to warn you, it is a terrifying word. All right. Are you ready for it? You're sitting on the edge of your seat. Confession. Now, timing that word with crackling thunder and lightning was too difficult, um, but you get the idea. It is a scary concept. My favorite definition of confession is agreeing with God. That's when I stop making excuses, I stop trying to hide, and I simply say yes to God, and I say, you were right, I was wrong, forgive me. There's no but. There's no here's why. There's no excuses. There's no justification. It's just laying it all out and saying, you were right. I was wrong. Help me. It's agreeing with God and his ways. When was the last time you had that type of conversation with God? Now, I hope it was recently because if it is, that means the Holy Spirit is continually working in your life. If you only had a confession to God you confessed your sins when you got saved 100 years ago. Hey, that's great. But we need to continually be agreeing with God and allowing the Holy Spirit to work on us and for us to say, your ways are right, mine are not. Help me, move me forward. So if you're going to take an assessment of your life today, which level of interaction with Jesus are you at? Let's look at those again in verse 1. He says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and which our hands have handled the word of life. So level one is you've heard about Jesus. Um, even if today was the first service you've ever been in, you probably knew some things about the Son of God. How long have you been at that spot? 
What's the hurdle stopping you moving into the next level of interaction with him? Level two is seen with our eyes. This is observing God at work in your own life or in the lives of people that you know. You have seen a healing. You've seen a restored relationship. You've seen a renewed mind. You've seen supernatural provision, divine direction. You aren't quite sure about following Jesus yourself, but you've absolutely seen him at work in the lives of others and even in your own life. What's stopping you from moving to that next step? Is there something that you're hanging on to that you're too afraid to let go of? Is there fear of what trusting God will look like in your everyday life? Level three is looked upon. Uh, the Greek here is an intent gaze. Um, have you ever had a love at first sight crush on someone uh, that you just couldn't stop looking at? Maybe you're back in middle school and first day of school and in walks your crush. And uh, you can't hear the teacher's boring lecture anymore. You can't hear your friends chatter about their favorite Pokemon cards. You are just locked in. You can only hear the sounds of birds singing. And it's just, it's the greatest, you know, day of your life. Um, that is this level. That's what this word gaze means. Jesus has become the object of your affection. You are locked in. It has consumed your heart, your, your gaze, your emotion. You have tunnel vision. Uh, in the Old Testament, God has Moses build a bronze serpent and put it on a pole. And he uses the same word. He said, if you gaze upon this serpent, serpent you would be healed of the afflictions that they had, which was from being bitten by poisonous snakes. It's a hilarious story. Um, but Jesus connected himself to the same story. He says, just as Moses lifted up the bronze serpent in the wilderness, the Son of Man must be lifted up, and everyone that believes on him may have eternal life. This intentional gaze and longing affection is great, but that's actually not the final stage. There's one more. Level four is our hands have handled. You can admire your middle school crush from across the room, but if you want her to go to the enchantment under the sea dance with you, you got to walk across the room and ask. I'm going to invite the worship team back up. So... The Apostle Thomas did not believe the news about the resurrection when he heard it from his closest friends. Look at John chapter 20. One of the 12 disciples, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. They told him, we have seen the Lord. But he replied, I won't believe it until I see the nail wounds in his hands and put my fingers into them and place my hand into the wound at his side. Eight days later, the disciples were together again, and this time Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you, he said. And then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. Look at my hands. Put your hand in the wound of my side. No longer be faithless. Believe. My Lord and my God, Thomas exclaimed. Jesus told him, you believe because you've seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. Thomas's hands have now handled the word of life. He had heard about the resurrection. He had seen Jesus at work. He had looked intently at what Jesus was calling him to do for three years. But now, it became real. He had touched the nail wounds. He had touched the spear hole in Jesus' side. And I love Thomas's reaction. The Old Testament is filled with the phrase, do everything the Lord your God commands you. That feels like a lot like rules and parameters for your benefit. The Lord your God commands you to eat this, not that. The Lord your God commands you to live here, not there. Marry these people, not these people. Conduct business this way and not that way. They were used to that. But when Thomas touched the wounds of the resurrected Jesus, it went beyond the Lord your God to my Lord and my God. He was back, and this time it was personal. 
Have you ever experienced that level of interaction with Jesus? If you haven't, let me invite you to do that today. Now, there may be things that are holding you back from fully trusting God and following Jesus. But you don't have to get it all figured out or solved to start following. Just trust with your whole heart. Say yes to Jesus. Turn from your ways to his ways. Take an active faith action in following him. So that means in a real practical way, when you read the Gospels and you see how Jesus treated people, the way that he spoke to them, the way he spent time with them, do that. Ask the Holy Spirit to fill you, to change your words, your priorities, your actions, your attitudes, your time and money management. That's active. That's being led by love. So we're going to spend the next few weeks going verse by verse through this clear and challenging book of 1 John. It's not an allegory. It's not a secret code. It's practical, relational holiness for everyday people like you and me. Are you ready to take some faith action? That's what it means to be led by love. So let me invite you to stand. Um, We're going to close with a simple challenge today. It is Name Tag Sunday. So on your way out, I want to encourage you to find somebody that you don't normally talk to. I don't doubt that you're going to find your friends and and talk to them. But today, let me challenge you to find somebody you don't normally talk to. Maybe you forgot their name and it's too, you've been here too long to ask them. Great. We bailed you out with these little squares. That's why we do this. Um, Find them, look them in the eye, use their name and give them a compliment. That's easy. You can do that. Find somebody you don't normally talk to, use their name, look them in the eye, and give them a compliment. You can tell them how nice they look. You can tell them that you love worshiping here with them. You can appreciate their specific ministry, whatever it is. But you're bringing words of life to somebody outside of your normal circle. It stretches you to try something different, and it blesses them, and that's a win-win. So, Can I invite you to open your hands uh, as a posture of receiving? Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this time that we have to hear from your word today. We give you full freedom to speak to us. On this Pentecost Sunday, Lord, we ask to be filled to overflow with your Holy Spirit. Renew us. Let your word fill us so that it goes to bless those that we interact with. When they left that upper room, they could not contain the spirit you had given them. It wasn't just for them. It wasn't just for their house church. It wasn't just for the Jews. It wasn't just for Jerusalem. It was for the whole world. Thank you, Lord, that they weren't selfish with what you had given them. The the gospel made it all the way to here. Help us not to be selfish. Help us to be filled with your spirit and take it everywhere do we go. Our neighbors, our schools, our friends, our family, our coworkers across the world. Fill us to overflowing with your love and let us be active with what we do with it. In Jesus' name.